Okay, for those of you who just uh, logged in, if you could tell me via chat that you're here because <clears throat> chat automatically gets recorded. So that's a great way for me to take attendance. And, uh, uh, you know, I get yelled at too if, if you're not here. So <laughs> we want to avoid that. I think we can keep it pretty mellow. You know, we've had, we've had some people who could make classes and, you know, I, I try not to uh, be harsh on them. But I, I kind of got to know, right? Still, I've only got 13 of you so far. We should have a few more. Hopefully they'll, they're, they're probably on the wrong. Oh, there's some people showing up right there. Good. Uh, and again, for those of you who are a little later, please uh, send me a chat that says you're here. So I have a record of it and uh, that way the commandant can't come after you and he can't come after me. So thank you, Mr. Klein, Mr. Hess. Oh, Mr. Hess, good. And Lucas is here. And I think the last one I'm looking for is Mr. Curtis. who hopefully will make it. Uh, okay, so let's see, let's go to plain speaker view. All right, so a couple announcements before we jump into the lecture. Um, the foremost of which is that this week's discussion is up and uh, it's a little different. Uh, but I think going to be quite enjoyable. So let's go look at that in Blackboard. Blackboard, which is where? Okay, so uh, the quick answer is you go over to the black buttons, you click on discussion board, and then you click on the history 100 thing and it goes to the threads. The next one is called the golden ocean. Let's click that open so you can see what's going on there. So 
basically the assignment is you watch a documentary called, it's part of a series called Empire of the Seas. You watch episode two, The Golden Ocean. There's a YouTube link. Uh, and uh, I want you to think about sea power as you watch it, as you watch it and write about your takeaway. What, what struck you about this? So, uh, and then I want you also, as usual, to respond to your classmates' points as well. Um, and I think one of your points is gonna be, yeah, well, Professor Smith is very British. It's true. Um, but I want you to get beyond that uh, and talk about, uh, you know, what does it tell us about sea power in general? I think you're gonna like the bits about Admiral Vernon. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff about making nails. Hey, Bruce Ross, good, glad you're here. Still looking for Mr. Curtis though. Uh, and uh, it's pretty, the, the blacksmith part about making nails is, is, is pretty cool, um, but uh, I think there's a lot of stuff that backs up what I've been telling you about sea power in general. So that assignment is due Friday at, no, Saturday technically at 2 a.m. Mountain time, or uh, that's midnight mountain time. Uh, and you should watch that also before the quiz on Thursday, right? Because there will be some eh, one or two questions about the video and the quiz as well. It is 54 minutes, so it's fairly long, but it's it's pretty slick. I think you're going to like it. Uh, okay. Um, in other news, uh, I had a meeting with the dean this morning. It looks like, no guarantees, but it looks like we're going to be doing this uh, all term right, that you guys aren't gonna come back for classes. The seniors might because they got licensing stuff uh, and it would just be too much chaos, I think, and, and not safe to bring you back at this point. So this is the paradigm. Uh, I guess we all have to just kind of suck it up, uh, including me. Um, so, but I, th I think we're doing okay. You know, I, I don't think this is the, uh, yeah. I'm the worst class in the world. <laughs> yes, but we're Bruce Ross, I get it. No, yeah, well, uh, uh, that's that's what we got. Um, hey, uh, the other thing is, if you can't make a class, let me know. Uh, send me an email, you know, and we'll try and make it good. I, happily today, for example, I did remember to hit record, so this this uh, lecture will be available to you later today. Uh, so if there are any questions, I'd like to jump into the lecture. Are there any questions for me? Okay, I'm gonna take that as a no. Uh, let's jump into the PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, which is that. Oops. Called Mercantilism and Sea Power. Uh, and so, you know, the last lecture, we sort of dealt with some of the naval aspects of this, and today we're going to deal with some more of the economic stuff that makes sea power. And in this case, we're really gonna be looking at the British because, well, you know, they were number one and uh, uh, they were the ones to beat. So I think it is worthwhile to figure out what was going on in their heads as they created their own version of sea power. So, uh, uh, one of the things you guys could do for me, but let me stop share for a second is, you should have all heard about mercantilism in high school. And what I want you to do is tell me, I'd either unmute and tell me or send me a chat. Did you really hate hearing about mercantilism in high school in your history classes? It's okay to say yes, by the way. But just give me a response. Do you remember hearing about mercantilism in high school? You should, should have been there. Yeah, so so Mr. Betancourt, when you say yeah, yeah, you heard of it, or yeah, you hated it, or what does that mean? 
both. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Carolyn was indifferent. Uh, wow, I'm surprised you didn't hear about it. It's usually part of the, the run-up to the American Revolution. Um, yeah, Samuel Chandler says it's bo it was boring and Burt McCarroll too. So I've got a very different take with mercantilism that I think you're going to find a lot more interesting. First off, it's a really blood-soaked enterprise, right? It is wildly fantastic. And there was a lot of resistance to it as a, an economic model. For starters, uh, it really oppressed a lot of people. Uh, and sailors were part of that group who were oppressed by it. <laughs> Good, Hess. I'm glad your teacher was great, so you enjoyed it. Um, so the, the way sailors resisted this oppression that mercantilism resisted was they became pirates, okay? Uh, and other people are going to resist too, and we'll, we'll get into that in a bit. But uh, it's really a pretty brutal practice. So this is not going to be about uh, the Navigation Act of 1651 and the triangular trade and all that other stuff. Uh, we're going to connect this firmly to sea power. So let me go back to my PowerPoint. Okay. So mercantilism is, is a label that covers a whole bunch of different ideas. Um, but first off, it isn't really capitalism because there's a lot of government control of these economies or government granted monopolies. Think the East India Company, the, the British East India Company there. There's a lot of coerced labor and that could be sailors forced to work on ships, especially Navy ships or it could be slaves. Uh, and it was also this way of looking at the world that, mm, at looking at the world as zero sum economics. And what that means is, hey, if my neighbor has a lot of money, that means I'm poorer, right? The, the idea is if that, that there is an economic pie and that's all there is, you can't create more wealth so if somebody gets a bigger wedge than me, I am getting poorer and he is getting richer. So the whole idea was to get more of that pie. Uh, and the goal is power and wealth. But the question is for who? The question, uh, the answer to that question is, is for the government really, for the nation, for the monarch in some cases, but it's really about enriching the nation. It's okay for individuals to get rich, but that's a side effect. That's not really the big point. It's about the power and wealth of the nation, right? And the, it's this competition between European countries at this point to see who's going to be the top dog. And it can get pretty ugly. That's why there's, there's so many wars during this period. It's all about this competing for economic wealth. Trade is the name of the game. Uh, so foreign trade, especially. Uh, and the idea is that this foreign trade is going to enrich your country and you're trying to deny that foreign trade to other countries. You want to get rich and that's going to make your enemies poor. And so, yeah, some of this might be domestic trade, local trade, but really we're talking external trade, to other parts of your empire, meaning colonies, uh, and mostly sort of big blue water stuff, right? Which is sort of what we would expect in sea power. It's not about the Great Lakes so much, it's really about the oceans. And, and if you think about it, King's Point is really a blue water kind of place, right? Sure, we have graduates on the Great Lakes or on the Mississippi River or working in the Gulf of Mexico, but when you think about King's Point graduates, probably you're thinking about working on a, a big ship crossing oceans, right? Merchant shipping is key to this whole mercantilist ideal. And the East India Company is, is a great example of that. It is a chartered company. Uh, it has this huge fleet of called Indiamen. This, this, this painting you're looking at right now is actually a merchant ship 
Look at that painting closely though. It has a whole lot of cannons. Uh, so it has cargo holds. It carries cargo, say tea from India, but it is also capable of protecting itself. Uh, the other interesting thing about this painting is that while you probably see four different ships, actually it's four different angles on the same ship. That's a weird maritime art thing they did sometimes so you could see the ship from all viewpoints. Anyways, back to the East India Company. It's this huge company founded in 1600. It has enormous wealth. Why? Because the British crown, the king, has given it a monopoly on all trade east of the Cape of Good Hope. That is to say all India trade and all China trade on, for British ships is restricted to East India Company vessels. No colonial Americans can, can get involved in this. Uh, so it's sort of Mare Clausam, uh, but not quite. It's more a monopoly, right? Uh, meaning that there is, uh, uh, you know, the, the government has granted special privileges to this company. Uh, and nobody else gets to benefit from those. But it does make people wealthy, it makes a lot of money, but the whole point of this company is not to help out its shareholders so much as to make England powerful and rich. Uh, merchant shipping as a whole is seen as a way of doing this, uh, and in a sense, merchant shipping acts as, as what we could call a naval auxiliary. That is, merchant ships, including fishing vessels, help make for a stronger navy. So the fisheries, and, and the British have big fishing fleets that operate in the Atlantic, but more especially off of Canada, uh, what's now Newfoundland and Labrador. And these fisheries, they take inexperienced young boys, really. They throw them on these fishing boats. They work on those for a couple of years, and the idea is that they become sailors that way. And the fishery, therefore, serves as a nursery for seamen. And you have uh, uh, more sailors than you need. So that way, if there, a war breaks out, those guys are available to be grabbed and forced to serve in the Royal Navy. Uh, also, merchant ships can be turned into privateers, right? Which are really sort of in wartime a way of licensing a merchant ship to attack enemy ships. Oh, that sounds a whole lot like guerre de course, I'm sure you're thinking to yourself, right? Uh, which it is. But it's also can be seen as sort of a uh, legal form of piracy, right? Uh, that you have this license to go out and grab enemy ships. And all these activities are meant to create pools of potential recruits for the Royal Navy. Let's see what we got next. Where, where do colonies fall in this? Uh, for starters, colonies are supposed to be consumers. Uh, they are going to buy goods from the motherland, in this case, England and Scotland, and consume them. And those could be iron goods or books or any number of things. Uh, manufactured goods. Colonies aren't really supposed to manufacture things and sell them to the mother country. And, and, and for the colonists, there are really only two manufactured goods that go back to England in uh, a lot, and that is spermaceti candles. Spermaceti means that it's made out of whale oil, uh, specifically the oil from sperm whales. Uh, and they provide a very clear, very clean candle light. Uh, which people like. So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing that colonists manufacture, if you will, is they build ships uh, and they sell them to the mother country. But those two things are really exceptions. What colonies are really supposed to do is to provide commodities, meaning unfinished stuff that the uh, mother country is going to take in and turn into manufacturers. So Colonies provide furs to England, and then in London, they're going to get turned into fancy hats. Uh, or Canada produces fish, or Massachusetts produces fish. Uh, New Hampshire produces timber. Uh, and then, of course, Virginia, Maryland produces tobacco. 
the Caribbean provides sugar, uh, tea comes from India, whale oil comes from Massachusetts, uh, or even Long Island. Uh, so uh, really providing these unfinished goods that can then be manufactured in the home country. So the whole system is geared to help out England rather than the colonies. It's okay for them to prosper, but yeah, that's really not the point. There, there's one thing I didn't put up here. Uh, there are what are called invisible earnings because they're not based on you know, like producing tobacco or something. And those invisible earnings can be earned from services. Uh, and in this case, the colonists make a lot of money by uh, shipping, right? They, 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 if you move a cargo from Massachusetts to London, you get paid for that. That's freight. Uh, hey, that sounds like the Merchant Marine, and you'd be right. Uh, but uh, those earnings are very hard to track, unlike a commodity like tea or, or whale. All right, I don't want to get too, too deep into that stuff. Um, the result of this system is, is, is it does generate wealth for the state, but it also causes constant wars because there's this sense of competition with other European powers. Uh, it creates demand for bigger navies to protect trade because trade is how you're going to enrich yourself. Uh, it creates bigger government because guess what? Uh, to create a bigger navy, you have to have a bigger government that can produce things to support that navy. And it's also going to generate resistance, which uh, comes about in a couple different ways. But central to all this are people like you, seafarers, right? Uh, and seafarers are at the middle of all this stuff. They are uh, essential to trade, right? You, you, merchant ships can't run without seafarers. They are essential to the Royal Navy, which needs these things. Uh, they are essential to operate the slave trade, this very unfortunate, you know, really brutal trade. Uh, and pirate, uh, uh, mariners are also central to the system in that they engage in piracy because um, sailors get really abused by the system. They have these very short, very harsh lives, and they will respond to that by becoming pirates. And can any see anybody see anything odd about the pirate pictured here? You can either unmute or tell me in chat. A woman? It is a woman. There were, in fact, a couple uh, of women pirates. Uh, Anne Bonny and Mary Reed are the, are the most famous of these. I'll tell you a, a little bit about them later on. But you can look up all, all that stuff on your own. We, we haven't talked about women a whole lot in this class. Uh, we'll try to sneak that in. So sailors. Uh, you know, they connect these. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Somebody was going to say something? No? Okay. Uh, sailors uh, connect these empires. Uh, they are very diverse. There are African American sailors. There are sailors from India. There are Native American sailors. There, are, you know, the, the system didn't really care about the race of its sailors. They were, as they said, get this, just hands, right? They didn't care about the color of the hands. So long as those hands were doing work, they didn't care. Uh, and this picture here sort of illustrates a, a young man who he's decided to go to sea. And uh, it's so sort of an unhappy scene. He's going out to his first ship. His mother there is cr crying because she thinks she's never going to see her son again. Uh, you've got one sailor behind him is holding something in his hand. And what that is, is it's called a cat of nine tails, or it's a whip. Uh, and he's teasing this young man saying, your fate is you are going to get whipped on this ship because the discipline was pretty brutal. The other sailor is pointing at something, or what he's pointing at is a gallows. It's somebody who's been executed by hanging, which is something back in the day they used to do to pirates 
uh, and then they would leave their body to rot on a prominent point of land uh, near harbor so that the sailors going back and forth could see what the fate of a pirate was. It's death, right? And this guy is pointing to the gallows and saying, hey, this is your fate. You're going to die. You're going to get executed as a pirate. So this is a pretty brutal illustration in, in some way. Okay, so these sailors were often referred to as Jack Tars, and this painting uh, called Watson and the Shark by an American, by the way, a guy from Boston, uh, illustrates some of these aspects about sailors. And I'm not sure this, this slide is going to work the way it's supposed to. Uh, we'll, we'll see. So uh, for me, Watson and the Shark is a fascinating story. It's a story about the uh, the guy in the water, the naked guy is Watson. And Watson was an apprentice who lived in London and he ran away to sea and he was on a ship. It was in Havana Harbor in Cuba. It's a British ship, but it's in Havana Harbor. And it's hot, it's really hot. So he decides to go for a swim. Uh, well, that was a mistake <laughs> because there, this big shark comes up uh, and attacks him and actually will bite his leg off. Uh, happily, some of his shipmates saw this going on and they row over to try and rescue Watson, and they do. And uh, Watson ultimately actually will become the mayor of London, England, what's called the Lord Mayor. So he becomes a really big deal, even though he has a peg leg and he's a former sailor. But uh, uh, so this picture illustrates some other ideas beyond just that Watson gets his leg bit off. Uh, so you can see these sailors are multiracial, right? They're not all white, uh, and that needs to be recognized. They tend to be young. They're young because, uh, well, frankly, they don't live to be old. <laughs> and uh, it's sort of the hard truth. What else? They are skilled. They have these maritime skills like, like rowing. Uh, you guys rowed on monomoys back when you were on campus. Remember that? Uh, and then finally, the last point was brought it to my attention by Plebes, oh boy, probably 12 years ago when, when I, during my early years at the academy. Uh, and that is you, what you see these guys engaged in is, oops, they get injured. That's not what I meant. But yeah, you get injured. They're brave. Yes, you can see that. Teamwork. Teamwork was the King's Point element there uh, that I missed. Mr. Curtis, glad you're here. So, uh, so I think this story is, is pretty good. This painting is, is, is pretty neat, and there's a lot packed into it that you can think about. Uh, and of course, this is already available uh, as a PowerPoint in Blackboard. And I am actually recording today if you missed some of the early portions of this presentation. Okay. Um, so mercantilism is, is really based on the sailors, but other unwilling labor, and that would be uh, African, uh, enslaved Africans we should say it. There is this vicious, you know, very unpleasant and very lethal and demeaning African slave trade. We've all heard about it. You can imagine how terrible it must have been. And the, but uh, while these people are slaves, they're also absolutely crucial to the British Empire and the system of mercantilism because they work on these big plantations uh, typically, well, most slaves actually go to the Caribbean and they go to big sugar plantations. You know, some, a fairly good number, come to tobacco plantations in the Americas or other types of plantations. But uh, really the Caribbean is the big scene. And of course, unfortunately, it's sailors who are operating this slave trade, although they're both sort of victims of this mercantilism. And take a second and read this slide. Uh, it's by actually a, a, a black historian who actually became the 
prime minister of Trinidad, a little island in the Caribbean. Uh, and I think it gives you a good sense of how central slavery was to the whole system, right? The mainspring of the machine. They're almost talking about it in engineering terms, right? Like they are what makes this machine go, right? It stimulates navigation and shipbuilding and employed sailors. Raise fishing villages into flourishing cities. Why is that? Well, because slaves get fed a lot of fish, which was cheap food. Uh, and it, it yields huge profits. It makes people fantastically wealthy because it turns out Europeans and others have this sweet tooth. They just want sugar. Uh, and it, it, how, the sweet tooth is really vile because people would go to any lengths to feed that need for sugar, including enslaving and slaughtering uh, these poor African peoples who get picked upon as the source of labor to do this. So it's, it's pretty grim. They live horrible, hungry, deprived conditions, yet they generate this enormous wealth, okay? Uh, so there isn't much justice in this mercantilist system. You probably picked that up from Pirates of the Caribbean already, though. So, okay. There are threats to mercantilism. I'm not going to talk about international competition here. I want to talk about pirates and rebellion and smugglers, because this system would crush resistance pretty ruthlessly. Um, the issue of pirates for England is complicated because remember there were all those famous pirates like Captain Morgan who came from England. And England had promoted piracy for a very long time uh, and really liked pirates because they got a lot of money for England. Um, but about 1700, just before that, the British start to figure out, you know what? We're making more money through the East India Company and ship honest trade than we are in uh, than we are through piracy. And at that moment, the British government turns on a dime. For more than a century, it had been supporting piracy, and in 1700, Parliament passes this law an act for the more effectual suppression of piracy. It empowers the Royal Navy to hunt down pirates. It creates, uh, it gives the power of even colonial courts to execute pirates. Uh, and it also gives a, a, a sweeping pardon to pirates. It says, hey, if you guys come in, we know we supported you in the past. So if you come in and take an oath, you'll never be a pirate again. All is forgiven. But if you backslide, we're going to kill you, okay? It's a, actually a pretty good deal. You're forgiven. You just can't do it anymore. Not many pirates can keep it together, though. It was such a gratifying life in many ways for them, sort of the ultimate freedom that uh, they, they couldn't stop from backsliding. And they went back to piracy, and that's it. If, if, the, if the Royal Navy catches you after that, or the court officials, they are going to kill you. And here again, oh, there's Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, uh, two female pirates again. Uh, and they got caught uh, with Calico Jack Rackham, I think, on a sloop. Uh, and uh, they got brought into court. Uh, and they were, they were condemned to execution, which is hanging for pirates but they were both pregnant, uh, so they weren't executed, uh, and then they just sort of disappeared. We don't really know what happened to them. They probably died in this filthy prison, uh, but we don't have any records. We have the court records, and then they just sort of disappear. So they're interesting figures uh, in history in that sense. Okay. So the British Empire after 1700, 
expends a, a pretty big effort to kill pirates, to execute pirates. And uh, I created this map for my piracy class. And I think what's interesting about pirates is they tend not to get executed singly, you know, not one at a time. They tend to get executed in groups. Uh, and sometimes it'll be like 30 at a time, uh, and sometimes more than that. Uh, Newport, Rhode Island, uh, 26 at a time, right? So that's a, a lot of pirates. Uh, and uh, uh, the Royal Navy is very successful in hunting down these pirates once, once it gets that mission. And the colonial court's quite happy to execute. So here's the, the price of rebelling, right? You, if you're a, a sailor of some sort, no matter what race or gender, um, if the system catches up with you, they're going to execute you by hanging. Uh, and the black and white picture here shows a pirate getting uh, hanged in Charleston, South Carolina. And here's the deal. A second ago, he was on that cart uh, with the noose around his neck, and uh, they simply, you know, whip the horse and the cart moves forward, and the guy would start swinging on that rope. And it's not like in the westerns where you drop through the door and they snap the neck and it's an instant death. This is a slow, choking death. You're kicking your legs, your, your, your eyes bulge, uh, uh, your tongue comes out of your mouth. Uh, and you will lose control of your bowels. So it's, and it's slow. It takes minutes uh, and it's humiliating uh, and all that. So it also happens that all these gallows are actually set up below the high water mark. Uh, that is on, on the tidal mud flats. And that's because the vice admiralty court judges only had uh, jurisdiction up to the high water mark, the, the high tide mark on the beach. Uh, so they had to be executed below that. You see that in Pirates in the Caribbean too. Uh, and you can see you wanted a big crowd around to see that because you want uh, people to see what happens to pirates. This, this happens in public and then that corpse is going to be displayed and it will fall apart slowly over, over the years, right? So it's, it's a bad way to go. Uh, and a lot of pirates do get executed, as I showed you on that map. Uh, slaves, when they revolt, get treated even more harshly. This picture shows a sort of gallows-like device, but he hasn't been hanged. This uh, individual has his hands tied behind his back, uh, and then he's set on a big iron and the idea is that he's going to be alive, but he's on this hook, and it's to be seasonal about it, this being Easter and all, he's going to die the same death that Jesus did, which is that eventually suspended like that, your uh, chest muscles uh, eventually give out, and you will suffocate to death. And that's what they say happened to Christ on the cross until, you know, a Roman soldier came along and, and stuck him with a spear to put him out of his misery. But it's a really slow, painful death, right? Uh, and it happened a lot uh, on the West Indies islands, especially. Uh, and actually, Haiti is a, is a nation that came, was developed out of a slave revolt. Uh, and there in the distance, you can see a ship, just as a reminder. This is about sea power, ultimately. So mercantilism in, you know, encourages this sort of cruelty. It's just brutal. Now, there's a third way to resist uh, smuggling. Uh, I mean, uh, to, to resist mercantilism, sorry. And that's through smuggling. Uh, and this is generally less violent. Uh, and a lot of American colonists engage in this. If you, you guys probably all remember the Boston Tea Party, right? Where Americans don't want to pay taxes on tea, uh, and so they throw it in the harbor. Uh, well, and there were a lot of American smugglers. Why were they doing that? It's because this whole monopoly system, 
say of t, is based on the idea that t pays a really high tax so that the government makes a lot of money out of it. Uh, so if you can smuggle t, you're basically engaging in a form of tax evasion. Better yet, if you can pay government officials, customs officials, to look the other way. So it encourages corruption. Uh, and there are all these regulations that prevent, you know, you can't take stuff ashore at a certain time. You can only deliver to certain places. Uh, so it requires a lot of people to enforce these anti-smuggling regulations. Uh, and sometimes it gets very violent, but usually not. Smugglers aren't desperados like pirates. They're just trying to make some money. Uh, but it, it, sometimes it does get very violent. But it certainly is resisting this economic system. So to wrap this up, mercantilism is this really cruel form of sea power. It's a form of economics that's all about enriching the government, trying to make the state wealthier. It's a, a, a blue water economy, shipping kind of stuff. And it, you know, because it is all about competition, it breeds conflict with other nations. Uh, and also you have to put down the people who are being oppressed who also make the system work. And that's sailors and slaves. They are absolutely essential to mercantilism. But the system crushes them ruthlessly. And now ask yourself, uh, are you surprised that the American colonists don't want to be part of this system? Because it's uh, uh, not, you know, geared for helping them. In fact, far from it. Their colonies are just there to help the mother country. So ultimately, Americans are going to check out of the system. They said, this is nonsense. And we'll, we'll talk about that some next week. Uh, so uh, do you all have questions for me on about that? And, and I hope that's better than the version of mercantilism you got in high school. Let me know. Any any questions here? Comments? How long was mercantilism like in place? It goes from roughly 1600. Uh, you know, it takes a while to develop. It sort of uh, comes into its final form right about the time the Royal Navy is formed. I don't think that's a coincidence. I think there's a connection there. Uh, and it lasts until the 1850s, 1840s actually, when the, when the British discover free trade. Uh, and let me tell you right now, the Americans beat them to it. Uh, right from the American Revolution, the United States has believed in free trade. We didn't like mercantilism. We weren't going to engage in that sort of trade. We were free, free market people right from the get-go. Uh, so I think that's, that's an important question. Thank you for asking. Anybody else? Kyle Curtis, not a problem. Glad you made it. I did record this if, if, if you need to uh, get the earlier part. So is that a more interesting way to present mercantilism? Okay, you don't have to tell me. <laughs> Let's see, what, what, what time is it? Uh, yes, it is. What, 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 141, okay. Well, I'm, 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 I'm glad you found that somewhat more interesting. So, okay, you've got uh, a video to watch and readings to do both before the quiz on Thursday and then Friday night, Saturday morning, depending on your time zone. You're supposed to get into that discussion uh, group, uh, which is all about that video. And I haven't set a really hard question for you. I just kind of want your honest response and I want to see a little back and forth, which some of you are beginning to get into. Uh, others of you are a little more hesitant, uh, but it's all right. You know, the, the more you interact, the, the better the grade you're going to get for starters. So don't be scared to do that. Uh, that's the PowerPoint. Uh, you've got your assignments. Is everybody clear what you have to do? Sing out. Let me know if, if you're not clear. Or drop me an email. I'm, I'm pretty good about returning email. All right. So let's call it quits. So I've got another Zoom meeting right after this. 
Uh, so we'll let you out a few minutes early. Uh, I hope you like that movie. Uh, it's really cool about the nails, but also look at the parts about Admiral Vernon. Uh, you're going to like Admiral Vernon. And uh, I'm not going to tell you my little secret about Admiral Vernon. We'll talk about that next week, but you'll be surprised, I think, at the connection I make uh, about Admiral Vernon next week. Okay, folks, I'm glad you all made it. 100% attendance. That makes my life easy. Uh, be well, study hard. Uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you, sir. Bye -bye.